Okay, like I said, uh, uh, I'm not a neuroscientist uh, or an architect. I'm a professor actually in electrical and computer engineering. Uh, but Cal IT2 started to have an influence on me in terms of broadening my own appreciation of how technologies could be uh, put to use uh, in, in a sort of a broader sense. Uh, I pulled this graphic off of the web. Uh, it's perhaps how, as electrical engineers, we might see this business. Uh, you can plant nine sensors on each of six billion people on this planet. That's 54 billion sensor, big enough market to get serious about it. Uh, but even though my last formal biology course was in 10th grade, uh, I thought it might be worth taking a look to see what the human body was doing, uh, even as it waited for electrical engineers to get caught up. And I was fascinated uh, by the fact that we seem to have a sensor network built in, whose job it is to sense what's happening inside the human body on a pretty dynamic basis and regulate things. Uh, so the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system, uh, we heard talk, talk about the autonomic nervous system, uh, innervates essentially every significant organ in your viscera. And while you can build sensors that would probe more deeply into one or the other, the one that seems to yield uh, the easiest uh, sort of signal that you can tap uh, at a very, very low cost is actually your heart. And it turns out that if you look at the RR intervals, or more precisely the second order and higher order statistics of the interbeat intervals, there's a lot of useful information that you can mine uh, out of that. So the approach that I was uh, taking here, along with my uh, little research team, uh, was not constructing new sensors, uh, but looking at what you can gather right now uh, and spend more time trying to connect it uh, through analysis to the actual experiences that individuals might go through. Uh, there's a little bit of data on, uh, actually quite a bit of data on uh, heart rate variability studies. And one that uh, struck me as quite significant was, you know, various statistical measures uh, that you can get uh, sort of normative data on. So the x-axis here is the age of the individual. These recordings were made uh, under ideal conditions. They were lying down still. Uh, but you can kind of see that there are certain patterns that are associated with how these measures evolve over time. So there is a correlation with age. Uh, as you age, your heart rate becomes more regular. Uh, that was the first little surprise for me. Uh, an irregular heart, uh, in many ways, is a healthy heart. Uh, and you can actually quantify it. There are formulae here that, in effect, uh, relate the age uh, to the measured values. Uh, it's easy enough today to find yourself a few students who can put together uh, an application that runs on a tablet or an iPhone. Uh, new devices are emerging, and so what we wanted to do was just build a framework that allows us to plug whatever device is available using whatever commercial radio we can interface it with and begin to look at the data and see what we could uh, get out of it. I should have brought my little bag of widgets uh, to show to you, uh, but instead I will share some data. Uh, <clears throat> So you get a lot of data and you wonder what does this data actually reveal in terms of the human experience. Uh, I fell into this observation early on in my personal experimentation with it. I just happened to be sitting down and listening to some music uh, that I care for. And at the same time, I was recording this data. And I was astonished to see that uh, if you look at the power spectral density that is associated with these time series, uh, you begin to find that there are some dramatic shifts that take place in how your body seems to, your body now, not your mind no EEGs here, reacts to the music that you're listening to. Uh, this really woke me up. There was something special that was going on at this point in time, which wasn't happening uh, uh, up there. And so I started to work backwards. Was this data leading me somewhere, you know? Uh, <clears throat> that took me, uh, so uh, let me just use an uh, analogy. It's a fairly accurate analogy. If you think of uh, your body as uh, ha housing a bunch of uh, uh, musicians, uh, they kind of bang away on their own individual keyboards playing a note of their own choice. And occasionally they come together as though there is a, a conductor and they play in harmony. Right? Depending on the activity that you're uh, involved in, there is more harmony or not. And when you see a pattern like this, it's as though all of them are uh, marching to the same rhythm. Uh, so something comes together. Uh, so I got interested in meditation uh, and uh, started to re make these recordings. And uh, I would see remarkably different kind of uh, configurations for the sorts of signals that you would be able to measure off of yourself. Uh, 
And I don't want to spend too much time here, but let me just draw your attention. This particular figure here, a PNN 50, it's 49.6. If you go back to this, uh, 49.6 is somewhere up here, and this is roughly how old I was, right? It kind of told me that this particular activity was doing something that reminded my heart of youth and rest. I had no idea that this would have uh, such a profound effect on me. Uh, so uh, because these systems are so easy to use, I started playing with it in all kinds of weird contexts. Uh, I should tell you that uh, uh, this system that we have includes uh, what we provocatively call the bliss buzzer. This is a little Android device that you wear in your, on your wrist, and you can program it to make a noise or buzz you when a particular uh, sort of physiological signal uh, emerges. You can do whatever you want. You know, you can write any formula you want. And so we uh, programmed it uh, to give us a little buzz every time there was an NN50 event, which correlates with lack of stress. And I started uh, to observe uh, what uh, the buzzes were like as I was eating, and I discovered some interesting things. Uh, I found out that meditative eating is better than distracted eating. Uh, like most people, I used to eat uh, while reading the newspaper and, uh, you know, got my cell phone out and all sorts of things, not look at the food, not savor the food. Uh, and it was quite remarkable. You know, if you look at this red trend line, it, the ones that go up, the higher up it goes, the less stressed you are. I then started experimenting with different foods, right? Uh, grapes, raw chocolate, uh, quiet sitting. Uh, so there are certain kinds of foods that your body seems to want and there are certain kinds of things that it doesn't seem to want. The business with the chocolate is actually quite remarkable. So here's a, a session of a sort of after meal dessert. Uh, I calibrated the effect for myself of having blueberries, einkorn cookies, uh, and raw vegan chocolate. And here are the numbers. Uh, the higher this number, the sort of more bliss you experience, so to say. It correlates with relaxed state. Uh, <clears throat> And it's kind of interesting. Actually, if you look at the shape, there are dramatic shifts in the shape. So these different foods, as they hit the sensors uh, in your mouth, I think affect your autonomic nervous system in very measurable ways. So this business about uh, high quality chocolate inducing bliss, you know, this kind of kept happening. So we did a little test in the lab with four of our guys. Uh, and we just sat quietly for five minutes, had a little square of chocolate, good quality chocolate, not, not the stuff that you get out of a vending machine. Uh, and we made these recordings for an hour. And again, I could show you the curves, but if you look at these numbers, these are all remarkably high numbers, uh, numbers in the 30s and so on, right? It actually seems like quite reproducible. And you can get this kind of data out of really cheap devices. Uh, <clears throat> so moving on, uh, what else can you get? It, turn, it turns out uh, that being able to record what your emotional state is, what experiences that you're going through is very critical to annotating this data. The more of this kind of annotation you have, the more meaning you can extract from the underlying data. This, to be uh, uh, direct about it, comes from uh, <clears throat> the other end of the spectrum. Um, this is uh, from a patient uh, who actually suffers from PTSD. And uh, we were able to persuade the patient uh, uh, to wear this device and collect long-term data and also provide a certain amount of annotation. So the patient actually records what they're going through, and on this occasion at 7.45 a.m., uh, the patient went through a spell which involved extreme cough, gag, pass out, and recover. Right? The patient then did uh, Tai Chi, went jogging, did everything he, uh, the patient knows to do to try to recover from it. So let's look at uh, PNN50, one of the measures that are there. Uh, you can, by the way, restate it in terms of age. It's just a formula, right? The formula maxes out at 80 years, right? It's a measure of stress. The higher up it goes, the more stressed the person is. Strangely enough, and we won't go into it, but there is this dip at the point in time when this episode took place, right? Soon after, uh, the patient's state reaches this, you know, the most maxes out stress level. 7.45, this is 10 o'clock, 11, 12, 1, to, right, the person is stuck in this aroused state, cannot get out of that, right? Uh, it's extremely invaluable to have this kind of feedback, uh, not only for the uh, patient themselves, but also their therapist, uh, to understand, you know, how their activities, uh, patterns affect uh, their mental state. So, real cheap devices, uh, just as long as you look at this data. Uh, 
once we had this information with this annotation, I was trying to make sense of this data. Could we have seen this? Does the data reveal that such an uh, event might occur? And interestingly enough, we found this paper, which uh, has to do with the effect of the gag reflex. And not to go into too many details, but there is a signal which shifts from a certain value to about one third its value uh, before and after a, an episode of gagging, right? And when you look at the data that we got from the actual patient, sure enough, if you do the before and after, this ratio actually shifts even more dramatically from 5.71 to 0.28, right? So there is a possibility that long-term gathering of this data might help you annotate much more precisely what is it that an individual goes through, whether it's things like eating the right thing that produces moments of bliss or whether it's uh, setting off memories that cause this kind of distress. A much more quantified way of understanding what uh, is happening to you. Uh, <clears throat> came upon a couple of other papers uh, you know, by now I have gotten used to it, but when I first uh, ran into these studies, I was sort of blown away. Uh, so this was an interesting study done in Japan where they had uh, the same individuals, if you can see from the, back, the shape of the back of the head, it's the same individual in the same town staring at a city landscape and staring at a park-like landscape in the same city. Okay? And the question is, uh, what kind of, what does it induce in their minds, right? The sense of peace, a sense of relaxation. And sure enough, as you might expect, uh, these forest-like settings, uh, uh, you know, th this measure, the high-frequency component of uh, heart rate variability, tracks uh, lack of stress, right? So it is noticeable. A room with a view of a tree, uh, there's a famous study, paper from the 1980s, right? Uh, promotes healing more than rooms without. So you can quantify this. Uh, it's not just sort of a belief-based thing. As an electrical engineer, this one uh, uh, knocked my socks off. Um, uh, you know, if you go to uh, yoga, they tell you to be grounded, right? You start your session by getting grounded. Uh, uh, so someone came up with this absolutely uh, uh, sort of amazing experiment where they had like 30 people uh, who had these little uh, conducting patches uh, to the soles of their feet. And for some of them, it actually was run to the ground, you know, like directly into the ground. So they were grounded in an electrical sense, although they were laying on a couch. Uh, and for some of the others, they weren't grounded. So let me tell you what the protocol is. Lots of curves here, unfortunately, but just pay attention to this one here, if you can see it, and this one here. Up until here, the, the x-axis is time, the y-axis uh, is a measure, if you wish, of lack of stress. So the higher up you go, the less stressed you are, the lower down you go, the more stressed you are. Just look at these two curves. What I said doesn't apply to the other curves, just these two. At this point in time, they threw the switch, so half of them were grounded electrically, okay? And you watch the green curve. Uh, it starts to rise. At 4,800, they actually opened the switch. They were no longer grounded, okay? And the green curve starts to come down. You see the gap opening up between this and that, right? So it sounds to me like we should be wearing conductive shoes. Uh, we shouldn't be having nylon carpets on our floors, or if we do, we need to make sure that they're electrically conducting. Uh, it sort of like seems <laughs> hard to believe uh, that this would uh, have an effect, uh, but it's measurable, uh, and you can measure these things today using extremely low-cost devices. Uh, again, uh, one thing leads to another. We also started to wonder what is the effect of a community, not just an individual solitary experience, but if you're in the presence of other individuals going through a shared experience, what does that do to you? Are there any effects? Do we, how do we sort of affect each other's uh, levels of stress. Uh, so this is a chart. You may have seen uh, these kinds of charts before. The x-axis is time. The y-axis basically is a breakdown of the rhythms, uh, the composite rhythms that uh, you record uh, when you look at this RR interval into different bands. Red corresponds to a high degree of synchronization, and blue corresponds to no synchronization. So if you see a signal down here, for example, in space and uh, scale and time, that means these individuals, there were five individuals in this particular recording, were like banging away on their separate notes, right? They were not together. They hadn't fallen in sync. Red means they were. So if you look at this, you notice that there are some occasions where they actually are quite deeply in sync, right? Five different individuals just sitting together doing stuff, various kinds of meditations, actually, in this case. Um, so there are these group effects, and you can uh, draw these uh, drawings which evolve dynamically in time that show 
So these are not uh, sort of an artist's rendition. The thickness of these lines, the colors all encode the kind of entanglement that you produce through different activities. So it seems like uh, <clears throat> uh, th these methods, uh, uh, these really low-cost methods, will help you understand uh, the social dimensions also. So with, I wanted to wrap up here by uh, uh, sharing this particular result, uh, which also comes from the literature. <clears throat> Again, it's kind of hilarious. Uh, so the y-axis here is the vagal tone. Again, the higher up this goes, uh, the less stressed you are. Uh, for this figure, the x-axis is what uh, is called uh, social connectedness, right? So if you're more socially connected, you're out here. If you're less socially connected, you're down here, measured in some appropriate way. And there are two sets of lines. Uh, these are people, the, the dotted line are for people who are kind of stressed out people, you know, like somewhat alienated from uh, their friends and so on. And the dark line is for those who are not, right? So you kind of separated them into two groups. And what you find is uh, even f regardless of which group you pay attention to, the more socially connected an individual is, the less stressed they are, right? So if you're already in good shape, you get in even better shape by being more socially connected. This one here, I think, is even more dramatic. Uh, the x-axis here is positive emotions, right? And the y-axis is the same vagal tone. So this is what we can measure using our low-cost devices. And once we have the tattoos that Todd is building uh, or the EEG devices that Mike is building, I think we'll be able to measure these things even more precisely. Uh, but what it, this shows is positive emotions enhance the vagal tone. So it's, there's a positive spiral here. But think about it, uh, given the generation we live in, uh, how do we today measure our social connectedness? You know, pretend you're in your 20s. Uh, this is how many friends you have on Facebook. Yeah? And how do we uh, gather positive emotions? How many people liked your post? Right? I'm told that there is some study which shows that every time you get a like, it's a little dopamine microburst uh, <laughs> that you experience. That's why we are so addicted to it. So in a strange way, Facebook's success is not the software engineering that went into it, but somehow it ca captured these two things, right? It sort of puts you in a state that you want to be in. Uh, so uh, my faint effort here, I think the design of spaces, uh, the, uh, the creation of the communities that, that benefit from uh, the activities that take place in these spaces can be quantified now at extremely low cost. All of this is done using Android devices, all of which, you know, there's two billion of them uh, on the planet right now. And the kinds of sensors we are talking about are already cheap, and they're going to become extremely cheap. So one, one can imagine really quantifying these measures and figuring out how to quantitatively do these trade-offs. So thank you. So I'm going to improvise here and ask all the speakers to just come up on stage so we can field any questions that you might have. Uh, we have a good uh, 20 minutes uh, for questions from the audience. Todd, Mike, Jorgen. <laughs>